let's uh, catch up to where we are. We'll briefly go through the letter uh, to refresh our minds about what we're doing here in the book of our letter of Ephesians, written by Paul to the church at Ephesus. Some <clears throat> challenge that it was not just to Ephesus, but to other churches in that uh, area to be passed around. Um, for me, I'm not scholarly enough to know that it was this or it was this. So I'm going to go with as it is in uh, the letter to the Ephesians. <clears throat> there are, I think, one or two manuscripts out of the thousands that are out there that uh, leave the Ephesus part out uh, and make it a generic uh, letter, but all the other manuscripts have it in there. So I think there's enough weight in the manuscripts to say that there's a good chance that this is a letter to the Ephesians. It is written by Paul. There's no or little doubt uh, about that. In the first part of the book, he begins to tell us, this is what God has done for you. And you see that in chapter one, particularly, he says, you have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And you'll find the word in him or in Christ or in the beloved uh, eight times, I believe, in the first part of the, the letter. So that seems to be a something of pretty um, much importance to Paul that he we understand that God is working in Christ and that we are being placed in Christ. In verse seven, in Him we have redemption, uh, which was or redemption through His blood for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, verse ten, uh, we are in Christ both in heaven and in earth. In Him, in Him we have verse eleven obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to His purpose that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his life. In him, you also trusted and heard the word of truth. So Paul speaks of the blessings that we have received from God. We need to bless God or praise God, he says in verse one, because of all that we have in Christ Jesus. And then he prays. It's typical of Paul to, of, of any letter, inspired or uninspired of that time in the letter they they introduce themselves, my name is Paul, and anybody else that's with them, Timothy or whomever. Then they'll address whoever it is the letter's written to, in this case, the Ephesians. And then he'll pronounce a blessing upon them, and that's what he does in the first part of the chapter. And then he prays for them, and that's what he does beginning in verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love of the saints, do not cease to give thanks or pray for you, making mention of you in my prayers at the God. It's a wonderful prayer here. I pray that the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding might be opened or enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your calling or his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance and his saints, and what are the exceeding greatness uh, of his, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward those of us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. The same power, verse 20, which he worked in Christ Jesus, he raised him from the dead, he seated him in, heaven, in the heavenly places, and then placed him in the above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but that which is to come. And he put all things under his power, uh, under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church. So Jesus, by the power of God, was raised from the dead. Jesus, by the power of God, was seated in the heavenly places. And Jesus, by the power of God, was given a task to do. And Paul turns that around in chapter 2, and he says, You too, by the power of God, have been raised from the dead. You're spiritually dead. You were in, dead in your trespasses and sin by the same power that God raised Jesus from the physical dead. He raised you from the spiritual dead and he has placed you in the heavenly places and he has given you a job to do. And that's the essence of chapter two, that we as a church, as the um, combination of both Jew and Gentile in the church, we have a task to be, to, to take the, the, the glory of God into uh, the world, to be the manifestation of God's grace uh, in uh, the world. And then in chapter three, he says, I, Paul, uh, am a prisoner of Christ, and I have been given uh, this ministry. And his ministry was that he would take the gospel to uh, the nations and 
or show the mystery of God from the beginning. That is that his people would be one people, not a divided people. The mystery of God that Paul speaks of is that from the beginning, from even before the beginning, from before the foundations of the world, God had the church of our Lord in mind. The church is not a building, not a sanctuary. It is a people. It is a people who have been added to God's kingdom by God, according to uh, chapter one. They are people who have been washed of their sins in the blood of Christ. They are people who demonstrate the glory of God. This is the mystery of God, that, and they are to be one. And so God has created the church. He has saved us from our sins. And so doing, he has created the church, which is the mystery of his will. And then in chapter four, he says, he begins to teach us in chapter one, two, three, this is what I did for you or what God did for you. Chapters four, five, and six, this is what you, how you need to respond to that. And so he begins with, I therefore, because of what God has done for you, I beseech you as the prisoner or to walk worthy of the calling with which you have received. Well, what's worthy mean? Well, with all lowliness, with all gentleness, with all long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. We as a people are to be a one people. And he goes into the, the ones. There's one hope or one Lord, one faith, one uh, baptism, one God and father of all. We are to be one. Unity has been placed in the church. We, are, we have the challenge or the task of maintaining that unity. And to accomplish that, verses 7 through um, 12, I think it is. Uh, well, actually down through verse 16, to, to accomplish that, he has given us gifts, the apostles and prophets that he used during the first century time, and then teachers uh, or evangelists, pastors, and teachers uh, that are to be guiding us according to his will, that we no longer be children tossed to and fro in this world, uh, but speaking the truth and love that we may grow up into all things. Paul says we need to grow up and be like Christ. We have been given gifts by God to accomplish that purpose. Those gifts are the apostles and the, um, the uh, prophets of the New Testament times and those who are faithful uh, evangelists, faithful elders, and faithful teachers who are to continue to guide us in the ways, in the doctrines of the apostles so that we can grow up into our head, Jesus Christ, so that we can look like Jesus Christ. And then he begins in verse 17. This is where we uh, left off last week. This I say, therefore, chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles. You're to be growing up in Christ. That's what the leadership that God has given you in the church is directing you to, to grow up in Christ. So in growing up in Christ, you can no longer be like the Gentiles or the nations who walk in the futility of their minds, who walk having their understanding darkened, who walk or live being alienated from the life of God, who are ignorant uh, or because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness or the hardness of their heart. They are past feeling. They have given themselves over to lewdness. They have given themselves over to uncleanness or to uh, giving themselves to lewdness or lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. They passionately or greedily, that's not really a word, <laughs> but they in a greedy way work all uncleanness. They, they, they starve for it. They thrive on it. But you, and this is where we are, you have not so learned Christ. And we talked about that word learned uh, last week. We did some research in it on the Bible, in the Bible, Mathatano, the verb uh, learned. The noun is what? We talked about this at the end of class last week. The verb form translated into English is uh, learned. You have learned. The noun form, a person who has learned is called a what? In most cases, we might say a student. But in the biblical word, it's disciple. The term mathatano, mathatano, uh, mathates, in the case of the uh, noun, uh, it's the word learned, has uh, the verb learn, 
becomes a noun, it is the word disciple. You, if you have, or, but you have not so learned, been discipled in Christ, if indeed you have heard him. Look at that in verse 20. You have not so learned, been discipled in Christ, verse 21, if indeed you have heard him. And I've always read that, or a lot of times I have read that, if you have heard of him. That's not what it says. It says, if indeed you have heard him, but they had not heard Jesus. Likely they had not even heard Paul because Paul hadn't uh, uh, spoken to some of these people to the face. These were people who were converted after Paul left. But when we hear the word of truth as it comes from evangelists and pastors and, and, and teachers, when we hear faithful words, for, that is the faithful word of God preached by them, we, Paul says, are hearing the word of Christ. We are hearing Christ himself, not just hearing of Christ, but we are hearing Christ. Not to say that the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers are Christ personified, but they God's voice or Christ's voice is speaking through them. So I like the way he puts that. You have not been or so learned or been discipled in Christ. You didn't learn verses 17, 18, and 19 when you went to the school of Christ. That's what you learned in the school of the world. In the school of Christ, you hear the words of Christ. You hear Christ speaking, and you have been taught, he says, by him as the truth is in Jesus. So Paul, I think here, is insisting that we have been enrolled in a better school than what the world has been enrolled in, set over against the ignorance and the poor, futile thinking of the world where the curriculum is sensuality and impurity. Christ has enrolled us into a new or a different kind of school, the Academy of Truth, we could call it, uh, the Academy of the Newness of Mind, we could call it. We are learning Christ. We are learning the truth that is to be found in Christ. In context, that truth is about the way we should live. Paul insists that we as disciples have been taught better than to live like pagans. So we should live better than pagans. So as we think about this school of Christ or this academy of truth, the academy of the newness of mind, uh, what kind of things do we study there? What's the curriculum that we are to study in the school of Christ? He could have said, well, you've taken Christian Ethics 101. He could have said, you, you've read the textbook, the, the rules, the standards of living. Instead, what he does is say, you have learned Christ. You know, you have studied Christ. Jesus is not only our teacher, Jesus is the subject matter that we are taught in the school of Christ. And that's so important for us to, to grasp. We're not learning simply facts of his life, uh, his death and resurrection. Those are important. We do learn that. But that's what you get in children's Bible school. When you go to church at, and you're in Bible class, you learn about the things Jesus did, the things Jesus said. And it, it's good. It's fundamental information that we need. But in the school of Christ to which Paul is speaking here, or of which Paul is speaking here, he's taking us to a deeper level. And that's where I want to take you and I uh, tonight as we study this letter. Paul's trying to emphasize something to the Ephesians. I'm trying to emphasize that same thing to you. As the rest of the uh, uh, book of Ephesians or the letter of Ephesians makes clear those who have learned Jesus will understand things like the lordship of Christ. What does that mean? We'll understand the heart and mind of Jesus. We'll understand the power that he makes available to us. We'll understand more about the peace that is to be found in him, the love that he has for us. In the school of Christ, we come to understand that Jesus lives within us, that his spirit lives in our hearts. As we attend the, the Academy of Truth, we, we, we learn that we are seated with him in the heavenly places. To learn, to study Jesus is not simply to know about him, but rather it is to come to know him. So when you're reading your Bible, 
and you're taking notes or marking notes, don't just learn uh, about Jesus. Come to know Jesus. Have in your mind the desire, I want to know Jesus. And let the Spirit of God, through the Scriptures, teach you who Jesus is. Not just his name, not just his place of birth, but who Jesus is, what he was about here in this world, what he was about in all eternity. Paul assumes that his readers know Jesus. Look at verse 21. Surely, he says, you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Maybe there's a little bit of sarcasm here. Uh, Paul says, you should know about him by now. Whether there's sarcasm here or not, there's no hint of doubt. Paul knows that they have been rooted in the knowledge of Jesus. I know the gifts that God gave you. I know the gifts that Christ gave to the church in Ephesus, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers. I know you have been rooted in if these men have been faithful to their task, you have been rooted in the knowledge of Jesus. Now, again, Paul, as we talked about at the beginning of the letter, may not have personally been acquainted with many of those who were worshiping in Ephesus at this time, but he knows that any preacher, any preacher of the gospel who is a true and faithful preacher would have pounded home these lessons about Jesus, which are eternal uh, in nature and central to the making of a Christian. All the preaching and teaching of the early evangelists could be summed up in one word, Christ. And that's what Paul is trying to help us learn, Christ. Paul will do an even more outstanding job of this in the book of Colossians because some of the people in Colossae, there were false teachers in the area of Colossae, in the church, I don't know, but at least in the area of Colossae that were denying the deity of Christ. They were de-elevating Christ. They weren't taking Christ out of the picture completely, but they were saying, you need Christ and this, or Christ with this. And Paul says, no, you don't need Christ with anything. You need Christ. Paul says in, here in verse 20 that we have learned Christ, but in verse 21, he has a, there's a subtle change from his title, Christ, to his earthly name, Jesus. I think that's with intent. I don't think Jesus or Paul is just using the two terms interchangeably because, well, I'll just keep them from being bored. So I'll put Christ here and Jesus here. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. He says, I am the embodiment of uh, of truth, that, that Greek word that Paul uses here and that Jesus used for truth, it's an interesting word to me. We may have talked about this before in Greek, I'll pronounce it wrong probably, but it's aletheia. Um, it's the word, the root word is lanthano, the word aletheia, the latheia comes from uh, the word lanthano, and it's negated with the alpha at the front, ah, lanthano, or ah, lathea. When you put that Greek uh, alpha in front of a word, in most cases, not every case, uh, like agape, I don't think it's the case, but in most cases, that ah at the front of the word, it negates the word. Uh, so it's ah negating lanthano. Well, what is lanthano? Well, the word lanthano means to be hidden. So if hidden is negated, what have you got? You've got revealed. If the word hidden is negated, ah, hidden, then you have revealed, exposed, unhidden. Jesus says, I am the unhidden one. I am the embodiment of unhidden or exposed. Uh, Jesus wants to, is the expose, if you please, of what? What is he exposing? Well, in this case, contextually, he's exposing darkness. And Paul will later on tell us that's what you're supposed to be doing, Christian, exposing darkness. So Jesus says, I am the expose. I am exposing darkness. I am the, uh, the, the opposite of hidden. I am revealed. And what do I, or I, I am revealing. I'm the embodiment of being revealed. You have learned 
darkness. You have learned futile thinking. You have learned ignorance. You have learned hardened hearts. But in Christ, he says, in the life of Jesus, we can see light exposing darkness and the evil therein. So Jesus is the expose of the divine reality. In him, we can see God. In him, we can know that God is real. Jesus was in the beginning with God. He was God. He became flesh and he showed us God. Jesus is the expose of true life. He spends a lot of time telling us, uh, Jesus did, of uh, what life is not to be about, what life is not to be focused on. He wants us to have life and he wants, to have it, wants us to have it abundantly. So he shows us, reveals to us what uh, true life is. So here in this school of Christ, there are three fundamental teachings that Paul is going to make us aware of or remind us of. Look at verse 22, chapter four, verse 22 that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And number two, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Here's the fundamentals. One, you put off concerning the former lust or former conduct. Number two, you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And number three, in verse 24, put on, you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, we're all adults here. We uh, have been through some form of schooling, whether higher education or not is immaterial, but you remember what you learned in first grade. You may not remember what you learned when you were in 10th grade. You may not remember what you learned when you were in eighth grade, but you remember what you learned in first grade, don't you? You learned your ABCs. You learned your numbers, one, two, three. You learned how to spell cat, K-A-T, right? <laughs> You learn how to add apples. You got two apples and one apple and you bring them together and you got what? You got four, right? No, you got three. But at any rate, we know, we remember what we learned in first grade. That was the foundation of our learning. Everything we know today is because of what we learned from that first grade teacher. You probably can remember your first grade teacher's name because it was all new to you, everything, teaching was new to you, learning was new to you, and those things that you were learning were the foundation of everything else that you learned. Well, in a similar way, Paul in this text reminds us of the first lessons that we learned in Christ. Now, we've learned a lot since then. You, uh, Some of you are holding advanced degrees in, in Christ by now. You know many things about Christ that some people have never even dreamed or thought of because they haven't gotten that far in their education, their spiritual education. But you should never, never, never forget the most basic lessons of all, lessons which are fundamental to everything else we will learn as Christians. When he speaks of putting off, and being renewed and putting on, he's reminding us of a very basic New Testament teaching, baptism. He's reminding us of what baptism symbolizes. He's reminded us of what we should have understood when we went into the waters of baptism as we began our walk as Christians. He's reminding us of what we should have become upon being raised from the waters of baptism. In these verses, some scholars believe that the early Christians uh, used this statement or a statement like this as a baptismal statement. When someone was being baptized or being uh, immersed into Christ, while that was taking place, someone was reading these scriptures. You are putting off, you are putting on, you are being renewed. There's evidence that this process was acted out literally by the person being baptized, that he would literally take off his garment, be immersed in baptism, and put on a, a new garment, a white robe. The same language is used in, by Paul in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, when he says, all of you were baptized into Christ and have what? 
clothed yourself with Christ. You have disrobed yourself from the things of this world. You have put that off. You have been renewed and you are being clothed now in Christ. A baptismal uh, event. In Romans chapter 6, verse 2, he says, we died to sin. Verse 1 actually gives us the reason for that. He says, how can, uh, I don't want to read it. That's uh, a rhetorical question that he gives in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. He says, what shall we th say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The idea was that uh, Paul had said, we um, uh, have grace from God and there's no sin that the grace of God cannot forgive. And somebody misinterprets that and says, well, if that's the case, then the more sins I have, the more grace I get, I should sin more. And he says, God forbid. Uh, that's not the idea at all. Uh, he says, we have died to sin, verse 2. This is a, a person, you can't come into Christ thinking, well, the more I sin, the more grace I get, because the person in Christ has died to sin. He has put it to death. And if we have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us, listen to him, all of us were baptized, what? Into Christ Jesus, and we're baptized into his death. In verse 6, we, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. We have to take off. We have to put off. We have to, the, the three fundamental truths here are renunciation, renunciation, renewal, and resurrection. We need to renounce. We need to be renewed. We need to be resurrected. And this happens symbolically in the act of baptism. Paul says we cannot live like pagans. We have to renounce. We have to put off the, the old self, the sinful habits. Uh, we can no longer desire those things and we need to change our mind uh, to, that, to that end. The first and necessary steps of discipleship is to learn to grieve or mourn over sin. Understanding what sin does to our relationship with God, it makes us sick to our heart. And as a result, we repent of those sins. We turn away from those sins because of what they do to the heart of God and what they do to our relationship with him. We die to self. You know, that's where Satan comes at us. Our self is not sinful, but he uses self. He uses our focus or gets us focused on self to the degree that we no longer focus on God and our relationship with him. So we need to die to self. And we need to, to leave that behind and follow. We learned this on the opening day of school. This is our primer. This is our basic teaching in the school of Christ. Secondly, we cannot think like pagans. We can't live like pagans. We renounce that, and we no longer, nor can we think like pagans. We have been made new, the text says, or the, another translation says we have been renewed. In the Greek, it's ananeo, uh, renovated. We have been reformed uh, in our minds. We have experienced a renewal of thinking. Our, our thinking has been made in the anoneo word, uh, new again or young again. Uh, the word neo means young. The word ana means uh, again, like annual, uh, annually. Uh, the word is you have been made, your mind has been made young again. Jesus used a sim uses a similar um, concept or teaching in John chapter Three, when he speaks of the new birth, born again. Uh, a new birth is required before we can enter into the kingdom of heaven. You were, Paul says, walking with a futile mind that left you in darkness, that left you alienated from the life that is in God, that left you with a hardness of heart, without feeling, without compassion. But in the school of Christ, as disciples, Montano, as learners, 
we learn to think the things of God, not the things of men. That's what Jesus says in Mark chapter 8. That kind of transformation comes only by the working of the Spirit of God upon our sin-filled minds and hearts. Paul says in Romans 10 verse 17, what? Faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. When we hear it, when we consume it, not just let it go in one ear and out the other. A lot of people hear preachers teach the word of God and it goes in it. That's, that's not the hearing that Paul speaks of. When you hear it to the, to the degree that it, you, you consume it in your, in your mind, it begins a transformation process. If you allow it to do its work, it begins a transformation process. And without that transformation, discipleship is going to be impossible. And we learned this just after recess on the first day of the school of Christ. And thirdly, we have determined to put on. The word in Greek means to sink into. You ever put on a warm, toasty jacket in, in, the, in a cold winter day? You, you just kind of melt into that jacket because it's so warm and toasty. That's what the idea is. You put on, you sink into a new garment. Become comfortable in that new garment, that new self. You put on the new man. You become new people. Created to be like God. Created by God in true holiness. That word true, aletheia, the same one that Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the aletheia. I am the unhidden. We are created by God to be in unhidden holiness or in true holiness, Paul says, unhidden holiness and in righteousness. What does the word righteous mean? Being right with God. Being right with God. That's generally because the English word right involved in that word we generally think that's what it means. It means we don't do wrong things. We do right things. We're being right with God. I don't uh, smoke or drink or, or, or cuss because I'm righteous. And it, I'm not denying that that's the way it should be, but the word righteous in the Greek is more in tune with the term or the concept of justice. We are created, recreated in God as Christians, as we are discipled, as we learn Jesus in the school of Christ, we are created to be uh, unhidden holiness, displayed holiness, in other words, and righteousness, justice. When you see someone in need, what do you do? Oh, I can't help you today. Or uh, we find a way to look the other way or go around the corner and not hear their pleas. We, we see people and uh, we, we treat people sometimes unjustly, unfairly. Righteousness is the Greek word that means, if, if you can think about it in your mind, take the word right out of it because we typically think right and wrong, and it is right and wrong, but think of justice and injustice. Uh, when you see this word righteousness, it's practicing justice instead of injustice. We have as Christians, as disciples of Christ, learners of Christ, we have adopted a resurrection lifestyle. We are committed to imitating Jesus. We are committed to patterning our lives after him, following in his footsteps. That's who we are as Christians. That's who we are as students of Christ. This new self that we put on is nothing less than the life of Jesus himself. And every kindergartner in, school, in the Christ school knows that. And that's exactly Paul's point. You know these things. The school of Christ is not so much about going to school or going to church. It's about adopting the new way of life. It's about adopting the way or the life of Christ. And even baby Christians can understand these central two truths. These lessons, like we said earlier, were foundational to our baptismal experience. In our, the dying the burial and the resurrection 
symbolism of baptism, we give the visible pledge to put off the world's lifestyle, the mindset of the world, and to put on the lifestyle and the mindset of Jesus Christ. And I challenge you, if that's not what you committed to in baptism, Paul says here, then what was the meaning of what you did? Why did you get baptized if that's not what you were doing? To have been baptized and to have missed these lessons of renunciation, renewal, and resurrection means you have flunked your first lesson in Jesus Christ. That there might be Christians who have forgotten these lessons, who still feel uh, justified while living like the pagans, who have, a, have disregarded such foundational instructions. It's appalling to Paul. How, how can this be? How can you be in Christ and still live like that? That thinking is futile. It's dead. It's darkness. It gives you a stone-cold heart. So we knew all of this when we first became Christians. How much more then, as maturing disciples, ought we to dedicate ourselves to continued living out of that commitment? If that's what we did as we started, how much more should we be doing that as we mature? Same thing with any, any course of study. Uh, when... You're, you're, you're learning English. You, you may not be able to pronounce or spell or say the word encyclopedia, but you'll get there because you continue studying the language. When studying mathematics, you, you might not be able to do long division. What is 13 divided into 3,628? Well, I have no idea. I can barely get past one plus one is two, but you'll get there. How? Because you've committed to study the subject. How do we get to this place of true holiness and righteousness? And it's by continued study, by continued allowing of the Word of God to work on our hearts and minds. So how do we know? How do we, how do, we do this? We know how not to walk. We know how not to think, Paul has told us. We know how not to do, so what is it we are to do? And this is where Paul is trying to draw our attention uh, in, in this school of Christ. How should we know, how should we think, how should we walk? When we learn Christ, we are left with the decision. We can remain where we are, or we can come to be added to and be a part of the family of God. You choose that. You get to choose. All of us get to choose that. But in the family of God, we cannot continue to act like we did in that other family. If we make the choice that I want to learn Christ, I want to be in Christ. If you make that choice, it's a great choice. But if that's what you do, you cannot continue to live like you did back there. There's a new standard, a new set of values. In the book of Ephesians, Paul emphasizes family with the language that he uses. In chapter 1, verse 5, he says, you are adopted as God's sons. In chapter 2, verse 19, he says, you are members of God's household. The word household there is the word family. You are members of God's family. In chapter 4, verse 6, he referred to God as our father. In chapter 6, verse 23, he says, we are all brethren. So because we are family, Paul would emphasize and teach us that we need to learn to live like family. Not just any family, but like the family of God. And in God's family, there are certain things that just have no place. They are inappropriate in God's family. They must be taken off before you can enter into God's family. They're a dirty garment that cannot be in the family of God. And in their place, there are new rules which govern our life in God's family. And they must consciously be put on, not just learn the rules like having the Ten Commandments. And I can memorize the Ten Commandments, but am I doing the Ten Commandments? 
So we need to put them on, not just memorize these rules, these family rules of God, but we must put them on, wear them, show them, so they become a part of our lifestyle in the church. And God doesn't make up rules just because, you know, I'm the father, so I get to make the rules. Sometimes dads do that. We're all guilty. <laughs> we get that power trip, and I'm the dad. It's my house. I get to make the rules. So we make arbitrary rules that really make no sense. God's not like that. The rules that God has in mind or that he gives to us, are that there's good reason behind them. Uh, reasons why God wants us to act this way in his family. So Paul has encouraged us to walk worthy, verse 1 of chapter 4. He's encouraged us to walk in unity, verses 3 through 6. In 13 through 24, he's encouraged us to walk like Jesus. And now Paul is going to give us some very practical teaching of how to accomplish this, how to do this. It's one thing to say walk in unity. It's one thing to say walk in, to walk worthy. And one thing to walk say walk like Jesus. But now Paul's going to take another step and say, here's how you do it. Verse 25. Rules for behavior in God's family. Number one, put away lying. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry, do not sin. Let, the sin, let not the sun go down upon your, your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Number three, let him who stole steal no more, but rather let him labor with his hands, working that which is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Number four, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, rather that which is good for edification, necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And number five, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed uh, for the day of redemption. Number six, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you. And number seven, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving, loving one another, just as Christ and God forgave you. Number what? Eight, therefore, be imitators, chapter five, of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ has loved us, given himself for us as a sweet smelling, as an offering and a sacrifice uh, to God for a sweet smelling aroma. So the first rule we come, have to come to grips with in the school of Christ and the school of the aletheia, the embodiment of truth, is that we need to be truthful. Put away lying. Speak the truth with your neighbor because we are members one of another. Paul talks a lot about truth in this letter and others. He consistently teaches us that we are people who are to be transformed or have been transformed by truth. He says in chapter 1, verse 13, we read it earlier, that we have heard the word of truth, which is the gospel of our salvation. The apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers are to do what? Speak the truth in love, but speak the truth so as to give the church or bring the church into maturity. Verse 21 says that we have learned the truth that is in Jesus. In chapter 5, verse 9, he'll say, the fruit of light is goodness, righteousness, and truth. That word goodness, and we'll talk about it later, is the usually the idea when we say the word righteousness, we're thinking right and wrong. The word goodness is closer to that definition than the word righteousness. The word goodness is like good and bad, right and wrong. Righteousness is justice and injustice. And then truth is the uh, revelation of uh, or being unhidden in our, in our lives. So we are the people of truth. We are the people of unhiddenness. And I know unhiddenness is not a word, but I'm just trying to emphasize the meaning of that word, the aletheia, the hiddenness that has been revealed. Since we have been transformed by truth, because truth is the first or the fruit that is produced in our lives, since truth is the way of life that we have chosen, put away lying. Uh, the word put away in, in Greek is literally take something and place it over here. Take it out and place it over here. Put away, set it aside, disregard it, make it a, a put it in the, in the trash can, in the refuse, put away lying. 
The Greek word is pseudos. You've heard of what a, a pseudonym is or a, um, can't think of another, there are several words that we use uh, the word pseudo for, uh, but it means false, means fake. Mm -hmm. um, and Paul says, put away that which is false, that which is lying. And uh, on the other hand, speak the truth uh, with one another. Speak the truth with those who are close to you, those who are your family. Lying may have had a place in our former family when we followed the ways of the futile thinking of this world, when we acted like the devil, the father of liars, John chapter 8. People in the world, they, they don't lie all the time. Every word out of people's mouths is not a lie. A lot of, them, a lot of it is. Uh, you can't hardly turn the television on. You can't listen to a politician without getting a boatload of lies. On It doesn't matter which politician. That's what they do. Uh, but it's not all the time. It's not what people do all the time. But if it's to their advantage, if uh, in order not to be harmed or disadvantaged in some way, a lie comes quickly to their minds, a lie comes quickly to their lips, and it's spoken without conscience. But in this family, Paul says, in God's family, we owe it to our Father. We owe it to our Lord, who is the embodiment of truth. We owe it to our Father to speak the truth, to be a people of unhiddenness, no hiding. People who understand the truth uh, by which they have been saved ought to respect that truth and love that truth enough to speak only the truth. Paul says we are members one of another. I like to think he's speaking there within the confines of the church. Uh, he does this on occasion. He says, we are one body and we're all members of that body. You may be a finger, I may be a toe, uh, but we're all members of the same body accomplishing the purpose of that body. So I think in that context is what Paul is speaking of. But there's another context that he could have been speaking of. We're part of the human race. And as part of the human race, don't lie to one another. Um, don't be destructive to one another. Lying is destructive, so don't do it. Whether it's speaking of in the body of Christ or with your neighbor who's not a Christian, speak the truth. We're members one of another. The next rule that Paul points out is that of being a peacemaker. Look at verse 26 and 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath nor give place to the devil. In expressing the emotion of anger that we all do from time to time, he says, in your expression of anger, do not sin. Don't hold your anger within because in so doing, you're giving the devil room to, to do his work, to move back into your life. We're trying to shed that old man of sin. We're trying to shed that relationship with sin. So don't harbor anger in your heart. I'm not saying it's a sin to be angry. There are sinful expressions of anger, but that's not what he's dealing with so much right here. He's saying don't harbor it in your heart because it gives place to the devil. Paul teaches about the wrath of God in his epistles, and he's rather clear about it. He says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. That's the wrath of God. Pretty strong words. When Jesus comes, those who do not know God, those who did not obey the gospel are going to receive everlasting destruction from the presence of God, from the vengeance of God. In Romans chapter 2, he says, but to those who are self-seeking, 
to those who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, but obey indignation, or uh, to them who ob obey unrighteousness, they will receive indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of one, every man who does evil. Strong words about the wrath of God. In Romans 12, 19, be beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Who's speaking? The Lord. It's not yours to repay. Let the Lord take care of that. Jude writes in Jude verse 14, now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, the men about whom he was speaking in that text, uh, evil men, ungodly men, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, uh, all of, the, uh, of their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. God's coming one day, and he's going to wreak vengeance uh, upon them. But then Paul here in our text teaches us to get rid of anger. Put it away from you. In verse 26, uh, he allows uh, us to become angry. But in verse 31, he says, get rid of it. Get rid of anger, put it away from you. But in 26, he says, you can become angry or be angry, express anger, but don't uh, sin in that anger. Don't miss the mark in that anger. One translation says you are being angry and you are not sinning. That's the idea behind the Greek uh, I, the, the Greek verbiage. It's okay to be angry or being angry, but you are not sinning in that anger. Don't do that. It's not anger that concerns Paul. It's what you do with that anger. The sin and anger comes from indulging that anger, harboring that anger, nourishing that anger. We are a people who have benefited from a God who is eager to express mercy. God's not eager or anxious or desiring to vent his anger. He will do that. But Peter says God's desire, God's passion is that all men come to repentance. I don't want to destroy you. Everlasting punishment is for the devil and his angels. It's not for you. But if you don't repent, you can't be in the presence of God. You can't bring unholiness into the presence of a holy God. It's against his nature. So... There will be everlasting destruction. But it's not God's desire. It's not God's passion. It's simply what God does for those who will not repent. God demonstrated his love for whom? Sinners. God gave his son, laid down his life for whom? For, for sinners. So God's not wanting to destroy sinners. He wants to save. Going back to Ephesians chapter 2, he says, You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by practice or by nature children of wrath, just as the others, but God, two of the most beautiful words in the Bible, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. God doesn't want to damn us. God's not looking forward to coming back and wreaking vengeance upon those who know not God and obey not the gospel. But that will happen. But God... Instead, he wants, he had made provisions, he has sacrificially made provisions that we could be in Christ, protected from that vengeance and that wrath. John writes in 1 John 3, he says, We know 
that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother continues to abide in death. Whoever hates his brother, he says, is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this, we know love. How? Because he laid down his life for us. And John concludes with this. We ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. You can't be angry to the point of sin and lay down your life for that brother. If you are that angry with someone, you've got a problem. If you can't sacrificially love someone, then you need to deal. You need to go make that right with that brother. You've create, created some offense or he has. You need to get that made right. There will be times when we become angry. That's what it means to be created in the image of God. God can become angry, does become angry. It's a built-in part of our nature to become angry, to become or be disturbed by sin. What person created in the image of God cannot be angry, disturbed by the thousands, the hundreds of thousands of children who are legally murdered in our country every year. It bothers me. It makes me angry. What person created in the image of God cannot be angry over how our culture just pushes and pushes and pushes homosexuality, not only upon the adults, but upon our children. It makes me angry. What person created in the image of God cannot be angry knowing that the human rights of faithful Christians throughout the world are being violated by tyrannical governments? It hurts. It disturbs me. It makes me angry. So what should I do? Well, I should go kill all the people who get abortions, right? No. I should go kill all the people who are homosexuals or who are pushing that agenda, right? No, that's not, that's not right. I should take up arms against all the governments who are anti-Christian, right? No, that's, that's not what, that, that's a poor or wrong expression of anger. You've given place to the devil. The idea of getting even or evening the score is, is not the solution. The solution is Speak the truth. Teach the gospel. Show the God of peace. Live the life of peace. Let God take care of the vengeance upon those who will not accept his peace. It's a hard thing to do. To trust God that he's going to take care of that. We want to take it into our own hands and take care of it. We can't see how God is working. We don't know all that God is doing. And so we, thinking God's not doing his part, we want to jump in there and do our part, and it's hard not to sometimes. Paul says it like this. Mike, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. It's not your place. Let God take care of it. That word wrath is the word para or um, The word para in the Greek language means to go alongside of, like parallel, para, parallel. And the word orgismos or gizmo, uh, organism, uh, your person. And the idea is being beside yourself, parallel to yourself. Don't let, don't get beside yourself. Don't go crazy in, in your wrath. Don't go to bed in a state of, of anger. It's not healthy for you, physically or spiritually. Learn to live in the family of God. Put down wrath. Put down anger. Anger that is saved up becomes an opportunity for Satan to attack. And he does. 
So if you have a difficulty with your enemy or someone has become your enemy, be quick to reconcile. Be quick to put sinful activity of that other person in, into God's hands. Let God take care of that. Recognize the danger of unresolved anger. Number three, recognize the importance of hard work. Verse 28, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands that which is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Stop stealing. Uh, the word is klepto in the Greek. You know what a kleptomaniac is? You ever heard that word? It's a person who goes in the store and he just has to have it and he, he, he doesn't need it and he, he doesn't, doesn't intend to pay for it. He just has to have it so he sticks in his pocket. It's, he's a kleptomaniac. He steals anything he can find. That's a person crazy with stealing. Uh, and that's what the word here uh, is, klepto. Don't steal. Don't be a klepto. And Paul could be talking about thieves who go into somebody's houses and steal something that belongs to another. The command would certainly apply. You can't do that and be a Christian. You can't do that and be in God's family. But contextually, since he is dealing with life in the family, I wonder if he might not be addressing another matter. Someone who steals something from the family, but it's not necessarily money or some physical uh, valuable thing. I wonder if he's talking about people who are a constant drain on the family because they don't work. And that seems to be what he's saying in the context. People who are lazy and idle and don't work. I don't know where you work or what you do for a living. I know what AJ tells me he does, but I don't understand it. So, <laughs> uh, but let's suppose you work with a team of 10 people and you got two people on that team who just do nothing. They, they have responsibilities, but they don't fulfill the responsibilities. And the other eight people have to pick up where those two people won't do their job or the job doesn't get complete. And if your supervisor who doesn't see what the other two people aren't doing comes to you and says, why isn't the job done? You could say, well, they didn't do their job. And then they sound, uh, sound like whining. You're a team. And as a team, you all do your share. But if you got people on the team who don't do their share, they're stealing from the others. That's the idea, I think, here. People who are lazy and idle and will not work. People who are constantly taking from the family going back to the spiritual family here, people who are constantly taking from the family, not because of difficult circumstances or misfortunes, but because of just sheer slothfulness. You know, we have in our little bitty congregation, we have about 50 people in our congregation here. And among our 50 people, we have four blind people, four blind people. And we can't expect these blind people to do what everybody else does. They're not uh, a drain on the family because they're incapable of doing some things because of their handicap. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about people who just out of sheer slothfulness won't do or be a part of the family. People who uh, define uh, memberships in, in terms of being served rather than serving. I'm a part of the family of God. You need to help me. They may be good, God-fearing, honest, non-stealing church members who rarely involve themselves in the work of the Lord. And I think Paul says that's stealing. When uh, my wife and I and our children, we lived in Russia, we didn't drive, we rode the bus wherever we went. Uh, we didn't have a car. And we lived in the very northern parts of uh Russia and the roads uh, and the walks were thick with ice and snow several months out of the year from October through March or April. We were just laden with snow and ice. Didn't stop anybody from doing anything. It just slowed things down, I suppose, a bit. But kids, they loved it. As all kids love snow and ice. They loved it, snow and ice in, in Russia. And sometimes 
when the bus would pull up to the bus stop, rather than paying their whatever amount the fare is to get on the bus, they would grab a hold of the back of the bus, the bumper, and when the bus took off, they would just slide along because they didn't uh, clean the streets from the ice. They just wore well, the, all the vehicles had chains or whatever on their tires because it, they just couldn't keep the ice off the street. So the kids would slide behind the bus uh, to the next bus stop or whatever bus stop they wanted to uh, go to. They were stealing rides. Very dangerous thing to do. And I remember seeing uh, one bus driver, uh, he stopped uh, not at a regular bus stop. And so he surprised the kids that were on the back of the bus and he ran back there and all of them took off, but he caught one and he slapped that kid as hard as I could, he could slap him. I was shocked when I saw it, but uh, I heard him say in, in, in Russian that uh, if you let go of the, that bus, that bumper, that bus by accident, I hit a bump or something and it knocks you off the bus, the car behind you can't stop. He's going to run over you. Well, that's neither here nor there, but uh, my point was they were stealing uh, rides. And sometimes church members do that. They try, to, they try to get all the benefits of being in church, but they pay none of the costs. And I'm not talking about money here. Um, Paul says, get to work. Rather than taking from the body, become a productive member of the body. Do something useful with your hands, with your mind, with your body, so that others can benefit from what you, you do. It's the trade of the world's family to ride on the back of other people, but this is God's family. We don't work that way here. Our aim is to have something to share with those who are in need. Stop stealing from others. Number four, verse 29. Show or know the importance of healthy talk. Let no corrupt, the word there is worthless or poisonous. No, let, let no poisonous word proceed out of your mouth, but only that which is good. One of my favorite Greek words, agathos. This is one of those words, I think the uh, A at the front of it does not negate the word. It's part of the word. Uh, that which is good, agathos, healthy, uh, benefiting. Let that thing come from your mouth. That which is necessary for edification. The word edification means building up. That which gives grace to the hearers. Let that come out of your mouth. A literal word-for-word -word translation of the, the verse. All words worthless or poisonous out of your mouth or out of the mouth of yours not be traveling out but that which is to be traveling out is good for building up of the need in order that, or the needy, in order that it may give grace to the, to the hearers. That's what Paul is looking for here in the family of God. Words are, are powerful things. We all know that, that phrase that we sung as kids. I don't know if you do it in your countries or not. Uh, Sticks in the stone may break my bones, but no, words can never hurt me. It's not true. Words hurt. Sometimes spouses say horrible things to their husband or, or wife, and it hurts. Uh, Paul's very concerned about the way that Christians talk to the family, not only the physical family, mama, father, uh, mother, or husband, wife, children, but spiritually speaking, within the family, the congregation, the family, he's very concerned about the way we speak to each other. Lying words have no place in this uh, family. Angry words have no place in the family of God. Here he focuses on a different kind of speech, an unwholesome speech, a rotten speech, a foul speech, corrupt speech. Later on in chapter five, I think he's going to talk about... Um, obscenities, and coarse joking, um, usually referring to sexual slanders or slurs. But here, corrupt speech is the opposite of good. It's the opposite of that word agathos. Agathos is benefiting. Agathos is doing something healthy. Corrupt then would be just the opposite of that, non-benefiting, that which tears down, that which causes rust or or poison. Uh, it comes from the word uh, sapros in the Greek. 
Sapros is a um, compound word. The first part of it means to purify. It comes from, uh, we get the word septic from it. So putrefy, I said purify, but I meant putrefy, septic. Your system becomes septic. It begins to destroy, corrupt itself from the inside. Uh, that happens uh, a lot of times in, in, in hospitals when uh, we can't get the virus or can't figure out what the problem is, your, your body begins to poison itself. Uh, and the second part of that word is the word poneros, which is uh, hurtful. These words, he says, are, are hurtful. Uh, gossip, slander, backbiting, discouraging words, uh, griping and complaining. That's the idea behind corrupt uh, speech. Um, very quickly, before we take a break, go with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. He says, why do you, this is Jesus speaking, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to, the bro to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that's in your eyes when you yourself do not see the plank that's in your own eye, hypocrite? First, remove the, the, the plank from your own eye that you may see clearly to remove the speck that's in your brother's eye. For, and here's the point I wanted to get to, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit, for every tree is known by its own fruit. Men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush, a good man out of a good treasure of his heart brings forth good fruit, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks, but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Jesus' word bad in this context, back up in verse uh, 43, uh, is the same word that's translated corrupt here in Paul's uh, letter in Ephesians 4. When I think of um, bad fruit, or when you think of bad fruit, what do you think of? That's it's rotten. Yeah, something that's rotten. Um, uh, do good trees ever have rotten fruit on them? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Don't they? <laughs> That's where rotten fruit comes from, good trees that... Uh, but the word um, bad here, when he speaks of bad trees or bad fruit, it's not uh, rotten fruit that he's speaking of. Every tree does that. Every tree, if you leave it on there too long, becomes overripe and then eventually becomes uh, rotten or a worm gets in it or something like that and it becomes rotten. That's not the understanding that Jesus is trying to get across here. The idea is not rotten, but poisonous. A good tree will not produce a poison fruit. It produces good fruit. Now, if it's a poison tree, and there are some trees that are poison, uh, uh, it's going to produce a, a poison fruit. It can't produce a good fruit. There's a, not an apple, but something that looks like a, an apple, uh, in Jamaica, I believe. I forget what it was called. Starts with an M. But at any rate, uh, it's, it's a very poisonous uh, fruit that comes from the tree. It may look like an apple, but uh, it, it's, it's very resinous, very poisonous. They say that if you stand under this bush or this tree during the time that it's dropping sap and the pat, sap gets on your skin, it will actually burn your skin. Um, I can't think of the name of that uh, that fruit, but it's a poison poisonous fruit. You can't eat the fruit of it. It will never produce good fruit. Um, an apple is never going to produce a poisonous apple. Now, you may poison the apple, but an apple tree is not going to produce a poisonous apple. It may produce a rotten apple, but not poisonous. Here, the idea is poisonous. Long way of expl explaining what Paul here, don't let poisonous words come out of... Uh, your mouth. Um, 
you have a good heart now. You have a transformed heart. And if that's who you are, poisonous words cannot come from you. You need to change your heart. Uh, Jesus uses the word hypocrite in that context. He says, you guys are trying to show that you're not or that you're something that you're not. You produce poison, but you're trying to tell people that you produce good. You're a hypocrite. Don't do that. Uh, Jesus would tell them, don't call me Lord if that's not really what you mean. Uh, you can't be duplicitous in the kingdom of God. And that's the I I idea here. That kind of talk, poisonous talk, has no place in God's family. We need to get rid of it. Rather, our speech needs to be healing and beneficial and encouraging and, and loving. This is how we speak in the family of God. Rule number five, we'll come to it after we come back from a break. It's 10 till right now. So let's come back at five after, give you 15 minutes. So at five after eight, uh, we'll come All back. All right, thanks, Mike.
You see that? Uh, no, Mike. I I, I see that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I see that now. Mm -hmm. The apple-looking thing. Yeah. yeah. It's a called the mankino. Mankino. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, mm -hmm. Tree. And they, they say if you're standing under that tree and it's raining and the water's dripping off the leaves, it can burn your skin. Oh wow. Uh, and it's found in Jamaica, it's found in, uh, in uh, South America, uh, another place, but there's a town in Jamaica called Mankino, I think it's a different spelling, but it's named after the tree. And back in a long time ago, the warriors would uh, dip their spears in the poisonous fruit and, or the arrows in the poisonous fruit and uh, uh, shoot them at people. Sometimes they would take captives and tie them to the tree and then cut the bark on the tree that, so that the uh, poison would burn their skin. Wow. There's not a lot of the trees left in Jamaica, I don't think, uh, but there are some there in that town just because that's the name of the town, I suppose. And they tell the tourists, don't, uh, don't touch the tree. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a, a poisonous uh, uh, fruit uh, that and that was the idea behind the uh, word mm -hmm. uh, there in Paul's letter when he says that uh, bad fruit or corrupt speech, it's poisonous speech, speech that hurts, speech that kills. Mm -hmm. uh, verses 31 and 32, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you uh, with all malice, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as Christ forgive you. Get rid of behaviors that alienate uh, you from other people, from other family members, that build barriers between uh, brothers and, and sisters. The word bitterness comes from the word acidity. The Greek word means acidity. Uh, when you're full of acidity, uh, it destroys um, the functions of the body, physically speaking. When you're, uh, are you familiar with the term or a disease called Barrett's esophagus? You're probably not old enough to be familiar with it. You will become familiar with this when you get older, most likely. Mm -hmm. um, not all older people get it, but a lot of older people uh, get it. It's a medical condition where the, the acid in your stomach uh, uh, begins to cook, basically, your esophagus. Uh, all of us have heartburn from time to time. It's the same idea, but on a bigger scale. The, the acid that's in your stomach comes up and it's so acidic that where the stomach and the esophagus come together, that uh, part is cooked, if I can use that word, by the acids that are there. And it's called Barrett's uh, esophagus and uh, it can be very very painful uh, and oftentimes can turn into a cancerous uh, situation because of the uh, damage that's done in the same way bitterness uh, is not good for your physical that the same way that bitterness is not good for your physical body it's not good for the lord's spiritual body so be careful what you eat don't eat a lot of pizza at night. Uh, don't eat a lot of Mexican food at uh, night. Be careful about drinking coffee at, at night because it could cause heartburn. And in it, uh, advanced stages of heartburn, the Barrett's esophagus can be very, very dangerous. Well, the same is true spiritually. Be careful of what 
you take into your mind. Be careful of what you take into your heart. It could cause bitterness uh, and cause lots of damage within the church. Wrath or rage uh, is to be put off, uh, Paul says. The word wrath comes from a word which means hot or heated breath. It's a compound word, actually. Um, in Mark chapter 14, verse 12, it says, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb. That's the first part of the word that's translated wrath uh, in, here in Paul's letter. To, to kill, to cook, uh, sacrifice with fire is the idea. And the second part of the word is the word suko, which is the word translated breath or or, or spirit, hot spirited. A person who is hot spirited can spew out words that that kill. Put hot spiritedness away from you. Anger. We talked about anger back in verse twenty eight. Now it comes up again. Here is the it's the Greek word for violent passion. Um, it's the word orge, from which we get the word orgy. Violent. Uh, passion. Put that away from you. Uncontrolled passion. In this context, he's speaking of uncontrolled anger or passion against someone. Put it away from you. Clamor or brawling. It's uh, translated, it's an odd translation. It means basically um, to cry out or to, to scream. Back in the 90s, 1990s, maybe 2000s, there was a kind of music, it may be still around, I don't know, where literally that's what the artist, if you can call them that, I don't, uh, they, they just scream. There, there was no words. It was just screaming. And my son liked it. I don't know why he liked it, but he liked it. He wanted me to pay for him to have lessons to, to go and learn how to scream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but that's the idea to, to scream out at someone. Don't uh, the clamor, the brawling, don't uh, do that. The Pharisees and Sadducees, the word was used by them in Acts 23, where uh, Paul was arrested and he was in Jerusalem and the, the uh, council came together with the Roman soldier or Roman uh, wasn't a centurion, but the pro council uh, brought them together and Paul split the, assembly by saying that he was a Pharisee and they started arguing with one, screaming at each one at one another. Uh, the word slander or evil speaking is the uh, same word that's sometimes translated in the English Bible as blasphemy. The word malice is the word kakia or kakaya in uh, Greek. It's a bad word in any language. It's, it's not a pretty, pretty word. I won't go into it, but the idea is naughtiness, evil, wickedness, maliciousness, um, it's, it's just a, a word that describes depravity and, and, and malignity. It's not a good word. When you see a person who is filled with or controlled by bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, what do you do? When you see that person, you meet a person like that in the, in the streets or in life, what do you do? Go the you, other way. You go the other way. <laughs> Why? you just don't want that kind of involvement in your life. Uh, we know that eventually their word is going to produce action and, and we just don't want to be around that. We don't want, we don't need that around us. And you know, you, especially if you got your baby with you, you're taking your baby out of that situation because you want to protect your baby. Well, Paul says when you, when this kind of, uh, uh, activity is taking place in, in Christ or in Christ's family, you, you got to get rid of it. You have to put that away. You can't be in God's family. Uh, you didn't learn Christ like this. Uh, we, we know better than to do this, having attended the school of Christ. In God's family, where unity is supposed to be the normal, peace is a blood-bought reality. Kindness, compassion, and forgiveness must be that which characterizes us. So if you want to sit at God's table, if you want to put your feet under God's table, so to speak, you got to abide by God's rules. You must put off what is characteristic of the world and its behaviors. 
and you must put on what is characteristic of the father, that which belongs to the father's family, belonging to, to him, to his family changes everything. It's not automatic, but as we consume his word, as we learn Christ, as we are taught by Christ, things begin to change in our lives and we no longer look and smell and feel like those people who are still in the world. So what's our motivation for behaving properly in God's family? Paul not only tells us what to do, um, he tells us that we are one body, that we should be caring for one another. He tells us that we don't want to play into the devil's hands, so we should not let him have a foothold in our lives. But there's another idea that Paul gives us here that we skipped, and I want to go back to it. It's in verse 30. I skipped it on purpose so that we could come back to it. We behave properly in God's family as we are schooled by Christ to do so because we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Spirit, Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Sometimes we think, uh, we read this phrase and we associate it with the unpardonable sin. Jesus uh, said that in, in Mark chapter three, assuredly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemes they utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. In Luke 12, it says, and anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, what is that? Well, it's rejecting the Spirit's word, the revealed word uh, from that comes to us through the apostles and the prophets by inspiration. When we reject that, it is the unpardonable sin. What do I mean by that? Well, he said here in Luke 12, anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will, it can be, it will be, it can be forgiven, forgiven him. God, um, for centuries, uh, tried to get men to come, come back to him, to choose repentance and come back to him. Men would not. They blasphemed God. They disregarded what God said. God sent his son to encourage men to, to come back to him, to repent and come back to him. They crucified him. They blasphemed him. They spoke evil against him. The Holy Spirit, the third part of the Godhead, has come to us now. He comes to us by his word, the revealed word from the apostles. If you reject this, there's not going to be another. God came, you rejected him. His son came, you rejected him. He sent the Spirit. You reject him, that's it. There's no more opportunity. And I think that's what he means by the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, uh, is the unpardonable sin. When you reject the spirit, there's no more hope for you. There's nothing else coming that's going to try to bring you to God. This is God's last pitch through uh, his spirit. Well, that's not what uh, Paul is talking about here when he speaks about grieving the spirit. Blasphemy of the spirit and grieving the spirit are two different things. We associate them because they sound alike, but they're not the same. The grieve of the spirit is, is really what the word says in English, causing or to, to cause to feel sorrow. When we cause the spirit to feel sorrow, do not cause the spirit to grieve. Do not cause the spirit to feel sorrow. You know what grief is when your parents die or when somebody you, close to you dies, you, you grieve for that person. It's a painful process that through which we all go when we experience the death of a, of a loved one. And the spirit grieves. We can cause the spirit of God to, to, to grieve. And Paul says, don't do that. Uh, the way we treat each other in the family of God has implications for the spirit of God. If you treat each other in these ways that he has spoken of and says, don't do that, 
then we grieve the spirit. We cause him to have sorrow. We're not maintaining the unity of the spirit. Rather, we're grieving the spirit. And Paul says, don't, don't do that. The spirit has a, a role to play in our lives. Paul talks about it in this book on several occasions. We are filled with the Spirit. Chapter 1, verse 13, the Spirit is building us into a family. Chapter 2, verse 22, we have the unity of the Spirit. Chapter 4, verse th th uh, 3, and now he says, don't grieve the Spirit. When you treat each other as though the Spirit of God is not living within us, uh, we're grieving the spirit. When we ignore uh, or undermine uh, his work in the family of God, we are grieving the spirit. When we speak or act in ways that threaten the unity of the spirit, we are grieving the spirit. We have been given a precious gift by God, the spirit of the almighty God to dwell within us. Let us not despise that gift by acting in ways unworthy of the calling that we have received. But there's another uh, motivation here. We should want to treat others as God has treated us. Verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and rather be kind uh, to one another, uh, furnish that which is needed is the idea behind the word. Be tender-hearted, good, compassionate toward one another. Good spleen is the word in Greek, but uh, compassionate, forgiving uh, one another, uh, granting grace or pardon or favor to another person. Why? Just as God in Christ forgave you. So treat each other in the ways that Paul says, or don't mistreat each other in the way that Paul says, because you don't want to grieve the Spirit of God and because you want to do like Christ, or you want to do like God did for us in Christ. In chapters 1, 2, and 3, God forgave you in Christ, gave you all spiritual blessings, put you in the heavenly places. He did this because of he loved you. Treat each other like that because God treats you like that. Chapter 5, verse 1, therefore be imitators of God. Continuing that same thought. Be imitators of God. As Christ forgave you or God forgave you in Christ, be imitators of God as dear children. Now, AJ, uh, you only have one child, and I don't know uh, if Eric or Paula, either one, have children. Uh, but sometimes you have children who are dear children, and sometimes you have children who are they're not so dear. They're rebellious. They're hateful. They're, uh, they're not, they don't endear themselves unto us. They react or live contrary to the spirit of the family. And it hurts when that happens. But here Paul uses the term, be imitators of God as dear children. That is children who truly love the father. Peter will uh, speak of this in his first epistle as, as well, talking about uh, dear children or people who are uh, faithful children of God. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, dear children and walk in love. There's that word walk again, Paul's, one of Paul's favorite words. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice for a sweet smelling savor. God has done wonderful things for us, even though we are so undeserving. He forgave us through Christ, even though we were dead in our sins. He loved us through Christ, even though it meant sending his son to the cross. Paul's saying, how can you do otherwise? If you are a dear child of God, someone who wants to be like God, someone who wants to imitate the father, how can we do otherwise? How can we not forgive? Because God forgave us. How can we not love after God has so loved us? How can we not love? We have abused God. We have uh, blasphemed God, to use uh, Paul's words. We have um, rebelled against God. We have offended God, but he forgave because he loved. 
He sent his son to die for us and provide forgiveness for us. No abuse, no slight, no offense that we have suffered at the hands of our brothers can be greater than the offense that we have brought before God. And yet God forgives. And Paul says, it would be an ungrateful thing to do for you not to forgive your brother. This is how we work in the family of God. We act like our father as dear children. It's the parent who sets the standards by which the children must live. The character and, and actions of our heavenly father determine the behaviors that we as Christians must portray in his family, his church. So Paul says, imitate your father, learn from his example how we ought to uh, conduct ourselves in his, his household. How does he behave? Well, he sacrifices himself on our behalf. He seeks to help us, not hinder us or harm us. How should you behave toward your brothers and sisters? The same way. And Jesus would say to your enemy, to those outside of Christ, to those in the world, be the same way. Because that's what God does. He is merciful to whom? The just and the unjust. The sun shines upon the just and the unjust. The rain comes for the just and the unjust. God treats even those who despise him with uh, fairness, with justice. Paul in this passage is teaching us how to be above the world. Um, the world is not evil in everything it does. There are some people in the world that have a very high ethical uh, standard. But Paul is teaching us that we need to tap into a, a higher power, the power of God himself, the power of Christ himself, in order to be a part of his family, to uh, live uh, in him. Now to him, he says in chapter three, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory by the church, uh, by Christ, in the church by Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's hard to do some of the things that Paul gives us here to do, but by the power of God, by the power of God in Christ Jesus, we can. How would you define the word holy? I think holy being pure. I know it's separated for a certain reason, but I consider it more as a pure. Okay, it, it's both. You're, you're exactly right. It's a uh, being purified so that you can be used for a holy purpose. Uh, the idea behind sacred is separated for a holy purpose, but uh, just because I'm separated for a holy purpose, if I'm still defiled, still unclean, I still can't be used for uh, a holy purpose. Uh, a holy man in the Old Testament had to go through very rigid rituals to be pronounced holy and thus usable by God. A holy place in the Old Testament, like the tabernacle or the temple, had to go through very rigorous rituals in order for it to be pronounced holy and usable by, usable by God. So if I say a thing is unholy, what do I mean? Not usable. That's exactly right. He's not pure. He's not set apart, and thus he's not usable by God. For a thing to be unholy means that it has somehow become defiled, or to say the least, it has not been cleansed or purified for, for use. A couple hundred years before Christ came, Jesus came, the temple in Jerusalem was sacked. It was captured. The infiltrating army... Um, his name slips me right now. 
<laughs> drawing a blank. Anyway, um, what is his name? It's going to bother me the rest of the night. Uh, the infiltrating army led by General whoever he was um, in order to demoralize the Jews, Antiochus, that's his name, Antiochus, um, in order to demoralized the Jews, he intentionally defiled the temple with pig's blood. He slew pigs and smeared, had blood, the blood smeared all over uh, the temple so that the Jews could not go there and worship. And it just took the life right out of the Jews, just like he intended to do. Uh, in order for the temple ever to be used again, it had to go through a rigorous cleansing process to be sanctified and holy and usable by God. So people throughout the centuries, some have anyway, uh, have had a strong, even an extremist desire to be holy or pure, to use your words, A.J., uh, and history is full of examples of it. In, in the name of religion or faith, in the pursuit of holiness, a man, uh, Simon the Stylite, he erected a 50-foot pole, built a platform on top of that 50-foot foot pole, and lived there for 28 years. It's very seldom coming down. He would Food would be raised or lowered to him through a bucket or whatever his... Uh, cleaning process would be done through buckets and so forth. 28 years he, he lived up there, and I don't know how, long, how often he came down, but it wasn't very often. He was called Simon the Stylite. He lived at the top of the... Uh, top of the... A few years ago, several men strapped themselves into jet airliners and crashed into buildings in New York and Washington and with targets in other places, killing thousands of innocent people because they thought that action, they were told that action would make them holy in their religion. Some have chosen to live in caves. Some have chosen to become hermits uh, in the wilderness or bury themselves in underground caverns, never seeing anybody again, all in the pursuit of holiness. Some have determined to mortify the flesh uh, with constant fasting, uh, wearing of hair shirts, very rough garments to chafe and irritate the body so that they would not fulfill the desires of the flesh, beating themselves with rods and whips. Some refused to bathe or care for wounds. They slept on boards. They locked themselves in rooms. They literally put out, gouged out their own eyes and cut off their own tongues, all in the pursuit of holiness. There have been periods of history in Christendom when vows of celibacy, even castration, were quite common among those who pursued holiness. And when you think about that, when you think about what people did to themselves, and you think about that from the perspective of the world, when they see these people who claim to be godly, can't claim to be Christians doing that to themselves, it's no wonder people are afraid of Christianity. <laughs> I would be. If I thought that's what it takes to be a Christian, you cut out your tongue or you gouge out your ears or you castrate yourself. If I thought that's what it meant to be a Christian, I don't want to do that. But they did it in the pursuit of holiness. They thought this is what would work, that this would be the thing that would help them be more holy. They were confused, but they were dedicated to the pursuit of holiness. On the other extreme, however, you have some who fail to take holiness very seriously at all. Faithfulness is dropping a dime in the Salvation Army's Christian uh, Christmas bucket. Purity is being sexually promiscuous but not going all the way or drinking but not getting plastered or not doing the, the, the big sin. On the one hand, you have these people ignorantly and overpassionate who will do anything to 
be what is in their minds pure. And on the other hand, you have these people who are just absolutely apathetic. You got fanaticism and indifference. Both are extremes. Which one sounds more like us? Well, I don't want to go to the extreme. I don't think it's necessary that we go to that extreme. And I don't think we should go to uh, the other stream, extreme. But which one would you rather be thought of as a fanatic or cheapen holiness into living just above the morality of the time so that you don't stick out? Would you rather measure your life against the, the guy next door or against a holy God, which is easier? To excuse sin and deal with the consequences or to root it out of your life and replace it with a passion for holiness. I don't think we ought to go to those extremes where people do things to their bodies, thinking, mortifying the flesh in that sense, literally uh, thinking that's going to um, uh, root out sin. Paul tells us in the book of Colossians, that's not going to work. It's Christ. Uh, putting Christ in you not cutting your tongue off or gouging your eyes out uh, that is going to make you holy. It's Christ in you. The unfortunate fact is that many people claiming Christian just, we don't talk about holiness. Holiness is hard. We'll do that on Sunday, but it's too hard to practice all the time. Holiness makes us stand out from the world. People think we're weird. Holiness raises a host of unwanted issues like sin. We really have to define sin. Guilt. I don't want to feel guilty. Self-denial. <laughs> Self-denial is not what I live for. Things that our culture has been trying to avoid for years. In that light, the question we are forced to consider when we come to Ephesians chapter five is can we be Christians and avoid or shy away from the subject of holiness? Paul in this letter, in the latter half of Ephesians speaks to us across the centuries about how to walk worthy of our vocation, our calling. He says there are just certain things that go along with being a Christian. Uh, unity, maintaining the unity of the spirit, conducting how we conduct ourselves in the family of God. This is God's house, bought with the blood of Christ, uni unified by the work of the spirit. This is God's house. And there are certain rules that apply in the family that need to be respected. And we, un we understand that. And we, we, uh, we, we must humble ourselves and be gentle and be loving and be unified and get rid of those behaviors which tear the family apart. And we need to put on favor, uh, um, uh, behaviors that bind the family together. The thing I notice about these characteristics or virtues and vices of chapter four is that they are behaviors that we grow into as we grow out of that futile mindset that we had or obtained from the world. As we look at those house rules that we just looked at in chapter four, it's about spiritual maturity. It takes spiritual maturity, for example, to deal with anger unwholesome talk. If we have been involved in a culture that lying is second nature, so to speak, it takes a while to work that out of your system. Learning to be completely humble and patient and truthful and encouraging, uh, it, it takes time and takes spiritual depth. And, and Paul understands that. God understands that. Paul talk, or John talks about in his uh, the first epistle of uh, John about us being children and young men and old men. He knows there's a stage of maturity or maturing process in be being a, a Christian. If you're coming directly out of the world, 
a worldly environment, a pagan worldly environment, and coming into or being translated into the kingdom of God, these things won't come easily or quickly, but they are things that must come. I must learn these things in Christ. I must be taught these things by Christ, and I must learn them. I don't expect the 12th grade or the 1st grader to understand what the 12th grader understands in the, in the world. And the same is true of Christ in the church. He understands there are babes in Christ, and there are mature adults in Christ, and there needs to be a different scene, a maturity process. And if we're honest with ourselves, we see that there are matters in our own lives that uh, need to be, well, in which we have not matured completely. Even if, you know, I've been a Christian for 50 years, 50 years, and still I struggle with a, a rash tongue from time to time. I still let things get under my skin and, and bother me more than they should, and I give place to the devil in my uncontrolled anger. I have to be careful about that. I have to work with that. I have to continue to let the spirit guide me and, and strengthen me and mature me as I consume his word into my life. Even the most mature Christians can lose their tempers or have difficulty forgiving a brother or a sister because of some horrible thing that they've, that's been done to them. Paul tells us we should be completely humble and gentle and should not let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouth. And he's, I think he's telling us this is the ideal. This is what we're working for. This is what we're striving for. Let the Spirit of God work in you so that you can become this. And we need to take our Christianity seriously. It's not a game. But even when we take it seriously, we're still dependent upon the grace of God. At, at best, our flesh is, is weak. With that in mind, it's important to understand something when we come to chapter 5. In chapter 4, he gives us a list of things we need to be working on as we mature in Christ. But in chapter 5, his tone changes somewhat. His tone changes into a, as, as it begins to talk to us about a, a passion for holiness. Beginning in verse 3, Going through verse uh, 20, it's about personal ethics. And in this case, Paul is not addressing sins which uh, work primarily to undermine the unity in the church. That's what he was talking about in chapter 4. We need to progress past those things, get out of those things so that we don't destroy the unity of the, of the, of the Spirit, that we maintain the unity of the Spirit. But here in chapter 5, he's changed his tone, changed his point. But now he's talking about sins which destroy our very walk with God. And in this case, he's not talking about behaviors out of which we must grow, that we must mature out of. He says you must cut it off. This is not something like a bad temper that you need to work on. This is something that you need to, you just can't do it. So he's changed his tone uh, from here's some things you need to mature out of to be protective of the unity in Christ. But in chapter 5, here are things you must absolutely cut off. There can be none of it. There's no, well, I'll just grow out of this. It's I can't do it. You can't do it. There must be no hint of it, verse 3. It's improper, out of place, verse 4. It, is, it, it disqualifies us from inheritance in the kingdom of God, verse 5. These are the things that bring the wrath of God, verse 6. These are the things that belong to darkness, verse 11. These are things that are shameful even to be mentioned, verse 12. The idea, I think, here is if you have a bad temper and want to be a Christian, become a Christian and begin to work on that. Start working on that temper with God. If you are a Christian and have, uh, and, and someone does something um, un <clears throat> unforgivable to you, if they repent, you've got to work on forgiving. Work on forgiving that person with the power of God. But the things that Paul is going to talk about here, he says, you can't even become a Christian if you don't first get rid of this. 
If you are a Christian, Paul says that if you are involved in these things, it will disqualify you from being a Christian. You lose your inheritance if you do these things. So we need to understand Paul is serious now. He was serious before. You need to seriously work on your temper. You need to seriously work on your work ethic. You need to seriously work about on your lying. And, but work on it. Get it done by the power of God, by the Spirit of God. Get it done. But here, you don't bring us into the kingdom of God. These are deadly sins. And you can't be a Christian. Well, let's read it. Verse 3. But fornication and uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be even named among you. It is not fitting for saints, for the holy ones, for the sanctified ones. It's not fitting. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting. Rather, giving of the thanks. Paul lists six things that are not to be hinted at among Christians. I have a question. Yes, please. Why do you think Paul made the distinction between those two sets of things? Well, really, we're going to get into that, and he'll, it, it's um, the idea that the nature of these things that he's talking about here are so destructive to who you are as a Christian, they just, and so destructive to this, the Spirit of God, it can't be. The other things, he says, you can mature out of it uh, and work on it, but these, you got to cut it off. It, it just can't be, and the distinction is, I guess... Um, he says in, I want to say it's 1 Corinthians 3, maybe 1 Corinthians 6, um, that uh, fornication, uh, let me see if I can find it. Not put words in Paul's mouth. Let's read Paul's words. Yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, uh, Paulette, he says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does outside the body, or every, every, every sin a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. And, and do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So you are joining, Paul says in that letter, uh, if you're involved with a prostitute or sexual immorality, you are joining the spirit of God to that body, to that person that you are immorally involved in or uh, promiscuously in, in, involved in. And I think that's the idea he's saying here. You're, you're so, it's, these things are so disruptive to um, the spirit individual person and his relationship with God, he comes out very strong against these things. These other things are important, and I don't want to dismiss them as unimportant in chapter four, but he says these are things you can begin working on as you allow the Spirit to, to train you and to teach you, but you don't need to be trained to stop fornication. You just need to stop. Does that make sense? It does, yes, thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, so th these things that he lists here, all of them, I think, have to do with uh, sexual immorality. The first three have to do with uh, perversions of God's intent for sexual behavior, fornication, uncleanness, and, and, and covetousness, let it not even be named among you. Sex outside of marriage, you've got to stop it. Sexual behaviors and attitudes which are impure, you have to stop it. The state of coveting, coveting um, I guess that would be um, similar to what happens to a man's heart and mind when he views pornography. Uh, you, you have to stop this. Uh, it's not something you can grow out of. You have to stop it. You have to, it's cold turkey uh, type situation. I don't know if you know what cold turkey is, <laughs> but it's a, it's a saying in English. You have to stop. <laughs> um, the last three relate more to vulgarity but in context, it seems it's talking about uh, sexual matters, vulgarity, or foolish talking about sexual matters. And you know, 
we probably should spend more time defining uh, these words. Let's let's just take for a moment the the uh, fornication that's mentioned in verse uh, uh, three. What is that? Make sure we under, we're understanding here. What is fornication? Sex outside of marriage. Sex outside of marriage. Um, does your translation, AJ, have something besides fornication? Yeah, it has immorality and, Im and impurity. Uh, sexual immorality or impurity. So um, what is uh, adultery? Can we distinguish between fornication and adultery? Adultery, you're married, and fornication, you're not married. Okay. Your adult, that's exactly right, uh, Paulette. Adultery is you're married and you're having sex outside of marriage. Fornication is you're not married and obviously therefore you're having sex outside of marriage if you're having uh, sex. Uh, so it's sexual immorality is the, 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 the idea behind it. And fornication is an old word uh, that's not uh, considered or used much anymore, but we understand sexual immorality. And uh, today it's become even broadened in its uh, scale because it's uh, so perverted. And I think that's the idea behind the uncleanness. Uh, the sexual perversions that are out there today are just beyond speaking uh, about in, in polite uh, company. There was a time when we had a general notion of what these words meant, but a lot of times people you know, when you mentioned fornication, they're scratching their head. What does that mean? One of the dangerous aspects of our uh, uh, culture in which we live is the constant attempt it seems to make to get us to misunderstand or, or no longer consider these words. I read recently that the only sex or only, only sexual act our society calls immoral guess what it is any guesses the animals I don't know. <laughs> actually no they that people do that and uh you you can uh pay for to watch it um the only sex according to this author the only sexual act our society calls immoral is child molestation and there's actually a group I don't know how big the group is, but there's actually a group who's trying to get that repealed, that sexual immorality, or not sexual immorality, but child molestation uh, is a uh, fetish that ought to be allowed. Uh, I, I can't imagine the depraved heart that would think there's a reason for that or that that's a good thing. Rape is not considered a sexual sin, it's considered a, or sexual, thing it's called it's considered violence uh, so it's not considered in that people still think rape is immoral but it's 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 a violent act not a sexual act um the it it, it does involve sex i don't mean to say that but it's a violent uh act pornography uh the television networks they invite us into impurity every day advertisers prey on rampant sexual greed comedians movie scripts best-selling novel, uh, novels and authors they make money on their sexual obscenities and paul is very concerned that we as christians live out the highest standards of holiness when it comes to sexuality and it's not so much that he's singling out sexual sins as the worst possible uh, of all transgressions but uh, when a culture becomes perverted in that way, it speaks volumes about that culture and the depravity of it. Christianity is not anti-sex. It's just not. Um, God, from the very beginning, he says, procreate. I want you to have sexual relations. I want you to make more children, fill the earth with children. And Paul or the Hebrew writer says that the, the marriage bed is undefiled. Uh, what you do there in your uh, marriage bed, it's, it's pure, it's, it's holy. There's nothing wrong with that. 
But Paul knows that nothing destroys a passion for holiness more quickly and more completely as an unbridled passion for things sexual. And so he does single it out for that reason. All right, um, we are out of time. I hate to stop it at this point, but I don't want to um, uh, steal your time from you. So we'll start here at verse five, uh, where Paul becomes more strict in his language. Uh, and he speaks of how um, not only must you cut that off, you stop it. He says, if you don't, you will lose your inheritance. You can't be in the kingdom of God. These are strong words. Uh, it indicates to me that there was a problem in Ephesus concerning sexual issues in the church in Ephesus. And so you know, Paul doesn't write things uh, just because he has time to sit in prison and write letters. He writes Ephesus because they need this letter. He writes Philippi because they had a problem with unity. He writes uh, Colossae because they had a problem with the deity of Christ. He writes Philemon because he had a problem, problem with uh, slavery. He writes Ephesians. Um, and as we look at this particular topic in the chapter, they, they seem to have this problem. Um, there was sexual, immor sexual immorality taking place in the church, and there was reason for it, not a justifiable reason, but these people, they had the, um, the temple of Diana in the city, one of the great wonders of the world of the time, and it's the biggest, you've heard of the temple of Apollos? Well, the temple of Apollos had nothing compared, was nothing compared to the temple of Diana, and she had cult prostitutes, uh, she, Diana, the, the goddess, they had cult prostitutes uh, there, just like they did in Corinth. And um, some of these prostitutes became Christians, or some of the people who visited these prostitutes became Christians. And so Paul had to tell them, you can't do that here. Uh, don't come here and become a part of God's temple and make the world think that it's like the temple of Diana. It just can't be. Uh, and you lose your inheritance. Do not be partakers with them, he says there in verse 7. But we'll pick it up right there at verse 5 next week. Thank you guys for your attention. I know I just, I never give you a chance to speak. And Paulette, thank you so much for interrupting me a while ago. That's what I want you to do. Uh, ask your questions when they come up. Um, and um, if, uh, I, I, if you raise your hand on that little thing that says, raise your hand. I probably won't see it. So do what exactly what you did. Uh, uh, come in and say, I got a question. And I, I really do appreciate uh, you doing that because I do talk, uh, spend my time doing all the talking and I apologize that I don't give you more opportunity uh, for that. Uh, but I appreciate your patience. Uh, appreciate your being a part of the class and thank you for being with me tonight. Thank you guys you. have any you guys have any questions before we quit? Um, thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike, so for next week, is there any schedule change or the week after? There we're supposed to be off the week of Thanksgiving. I think, what, what week is that? Next week. Next week is Thanksgiving? Yep. Yep. Okay, so we will not have class next week. Um, I'll confirm that through email. I'll I'll talk to uh, Tommy, the director. Uh, but we're you know, absolutely if Thanksgiving that Thanksgiving is on Thursday, right? So mm -hmm. that's right. There will not be class. I'll just go ahead and tell you that there will not be class uh, next Thursday. We'll pick up uh, a week from Thursday. Okay. Thank All you right. guys. Appreciate you a lot. Thank you so much, Mike. Have, have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.